Welcome back to Intro to Physical Anthropology. I'm David Leitner. I'm your instructor, and today we're going to talk about gracile australopithecines. Gracile australopiths are one of two major groups of australopiths. Um, as the name implies, they tend to be more lightly built uh, than and more generalized in their anatomy than the uh, robust australopiths are. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started and meet who these species are. Uh, the first and, frankly, earliest Australopith we have was almost, probably, uh, contemporary with Artipithecus. Um, and this is Australopithecus anamensis. Now, anamensis... Uh, has an interesting mosaic of ape and hominin characters in the teeth and jaws. Uh, you can see right here the mandible, which is the lower jaw, has that characteristic ape-like U-shape along with some very large back molars. Um, uh, but at the same time, the canine and the, is very small and the CP3 complex is missing completely. Um, Definitely a biped, and how do we know? Well, we don't have a ton of evidence, but what evidence we have is pretty good. The tibia here uh, is thickened at the proximal end, right? So this is where the knee connects, right? And that tibial plateau where the, uh, the femur and the knee connect uh, is very thickened. In other words, it's carrying a lot more weight than you would expect for a quadruped. Uh, both indicate that they were bearing load on the lower limbs more so than on the upper limbs. Next, Australopithecus afarensis. This is probably one of the best well-known Australopiths. Uh, they existed from about 3.9 to 2.9 million years ago. Discovered in 1974, the first specimen discovered was Lucy, nicknamed Lucy, uh, by John, Donald Johansson. Um, this may be a direct descendant of Anamensis. Uh, we don't see Anamensis contemporary with them so far. And uh, uh, there are a lot of similarities. Now, in terms of cranial anatomy, one of the neat things about afarensis is at the low end, they're sort of in line with the, the range of chimp um, uh, cranial capacities. At the high end, though, they're significantly higher than chimp cranial capacities, upwards of 500 cc's. Um, this makes them intermediate between apes and humans. So this is the first point where we're seeing that, oh, brains are getting a little bit bigger. Um, it's less prognathic than apes are, but more prognathic than we are. Sagittal crests show an emphasis on chewing. It's hard to see there, but there's a thickened bone sort of down the middle uh, that runs sagittally, which is why it's called the sagittal crest. Uh, muscles would attach to that, and the, you can even feel it on yourself. Your jaw muscles go up under... Your, your, what is your cheekbone, your zygomatic arches here. They go under it, and they attach right around here. So if you start chew, if you move your mouth open while touching there, you can feel the muscle move. Um, for them, those muscles attached up here and had a much wider space to attach to because they had to be a lot stronger because of the foods they were eating. You'll also notice their zygomatic arches are much bigger than ours to accommodate more muscle and more stress on the face when you chew. Now, afarensis was definitely a biped, and we have lots of evidence for that. Short, broad, and rotated iliac blades like this down here. This is a very biped-looking pelvis. Uh, the femur angles inwards the way that modern humans do. Uh, the distal, fe distal femoral condyle, yeah. the distal femoral condyle, uh, is enlarged, as is the tibia, which clearly is bearing more weight, and there's a very deep patellar groove. You can see it even better here. Here we go. Um, 
and uh, most importantly, the big toe lines up with the other toes. It is not abducted. It's not doing a ton of grabbing with that thing. Perhaps the strongest evidence is footprints. These are bipeds. <laughs> they prove positive. This is how they walked. How do we know? Uh, these prints are 3.6 to 3.7 million years ago. They were preserved in a uh, uh, an volcanic ash fall uh, that got wet, probably from a rain. And then these bipeds, along with many other uh, animals that you can see in, on the bottom of the screen there, uh, walked across it and left their footprints just like in wet cement. Um, neat thing about tracks is you can tell some things about soft tissue that you couldn't tell otherwise, like the weight. Um, it's a small biped, probably 77 to 88 pounds, somewhere in there. Um, so kind of in line with chimpanzees, under 100 pounds. Um, its hallux is in line with its other toes. We can see that here. So it's not just the skeleton. We can see it in the actual footprint here. And it is clearly a, hab a habitual biped because these go tracks go on for a while. Also, interestingly, you've got the tracks of an adult and then either a juvenile or maybe a very small adult. Uh, probably more likely a juvenile, though. Uh, and it gives you a really interesting picture. Uh, the adult's kind of going on at a slow pace, and the child's trying to keep up. Uh, there are other places where it looks like maybe the child ran ahead, stopped, turned around, waited for the adult to catch up. Uh, which, if you have kids, man, does this feel human to you, right? Uh, it, it's interesting. I think there there's a lot of uh, non-scientific speculation we can get into here, but, uh, but I think it's really um, something special to be able to look at behavior frozen in time like this um lucy lucy is, was discovered by don johansson like i said in the awash valley in the afar triangle in ethiopia uh named after the beatles song lucy in the sky with diamonds uh so they say um and it uh it's remarkable for another number of reasons the first is at the time, it was the oldest fossil hominin ever found. We thought we were close to the origin right there when they found it. Uh, I say we. I was only a year old, so. Um, but uh, um, it was also the most complete skeleton found of a fossil human at that point. Um, just incredible just incredible, told us so much, completely changed the way we thought about human evolutionary past at the time, and continues to this day, even though now we've filled in even more blanks further back. All right, next on the list, Barel Ghazali. Barel Ghazali. It's a... Uh, uh, it's just a single mandibular fragment, which doesn't sound very promising, but we can still tell several several things from it. Uh, it dates to about three and a half to three million years ago. Again, discovered by Michel Brunet, and uh, it was discovered in West Africa. Important. Uh, it pushed the species very far to the west. Um, some have argued that it's not, doesn't justify being called a new species. It really seems to just be afarensis. Uh, but uh, Brunet holds on to the uh, to the new species uh, uh, designation. Um, it's important because it told us just how widespread Australopiths were. They didn't just live in the uh, in the Great Rift Valley. They didn't just live in parts of South Africa. They lived everywhere. Now, Tenyanthropus platyops. This is a controversial one. Some people say this should be Australopithecus. Others say, no, it's definitely related, but not the same. Tenyanthropus. Three and a half million years old, found in Lake Turkana. 
uh, Maeve Leakey, Justice Harris, 1998. Maeve Leakey, the Leakeys are uh, sort of the first family of physical anthropology, they, uh, or paleoanthropology. Uh, Maeve, I believe, is the daughter of Louis Leakey, or is she the granddaughter? Well, I didn't come here for genealogy. Uh, anyways, it's a family that has been involved in working in and around Lake Turkana and other parts of Kenya for decades, since like the 1960s at least. Um, it's a nearly complete cranium, but it's crushed. And that provides some argument. That's the, the, the grist for some arguments here. Some think this is just an afarensis skull that's been deformed. Tim White, who discovered Artie, is uh, convinced that it's just, we can't identify it. It is just too far gone. Uh, there's not enough uh, to identify any real relationships here, other than to say it's some kind of hominin, you know? That's about as close as we can get. Garhai. Australopithecus garhai, two and a half million years ago, Guri, Africa, in the middle of Wash. Again, Tim White, Berhani Asfa, in 1996. Um, really cool. Found in proximity to stone tools and animal bones with cut marks. Why is that cool? Um, up till this point, we hadn't found any stone tools or evidence of stone tool you like use. Uh, with any Australopiths. Uh, so this started making us think, well, two and a half million years ago. Again, it's not clear if it was their tools. There are uh, Homo habilis and, uh, and Rudolfensis are alive at this point. And so, and we know they made stone tools, so they could be just a coincidence that they happen to be there. But it is promising. And with the consideration that some species were using bone tools, uh, maybe stone tools aren't far off. Australopithecus africanus. Three and a half to just, um, just a little less than two million years ago. About 1.98. Uh, found in South Africa. Uh, and that's where the origin of the genus name comes from. Uh, Raymond Dart discovered it. Uh, Australopithecus just means southern ape man, and Africanus refers to Africa. So it's the southern ape man from Africa. Um, as I said before, this discovery was, uh, was controversial at the time because Europeans wanted to believe that human origins began in Europe, not in Africa. How could they? Uh, so it wasn't until about the 1950s that it was recognized as legitimate, uh, as a legitimate discovery. Uh, that said, it kind of, it became overwhelming, uh, just how uh, much evidence started coming up, not just from this particular fossil, but other finds that both Dart and other researchers were making through that whole time period. Very interesting. Uh, one of Dart's first finds was this, the, the Tong child. Uh, Tong is the name of the town near the quarry where this was dug up. Uh, and uh, it is a natural endocast, which makes it really fascinating. So the light brown you see behind you is the impression of the inside of the skull. Skull has been long lost, but the impression remains. That impression will have the rough contours of the brain underneath the skull in it, uh, because that's how our, our skulls mold slightly to the folds of our brain. And that's exciting. It means we can actually look at the size of certain brain regions on the surface there. Um, it gives us a great glimpse at that. Um, Dart estimated the age of death at about five to six years old. Uh, however, um, he was using modern human growth rates, which take 
probably take longer. Using more ape-like rates, you come up with a, an estimate of around two to three years old. Uh, Maturity-wise, it may have been around five to six-ish in its own sort of um, rate of growth, but uh, or its own stage of growth. But uh, but chronologically, it would have only been about two or three years old. Interesting thing about this too. Uh, there is a tiny hole in the back of the eye that is probably from a talon. Uh, that is, in other words, this little guy was picked up by probably an eagle or other large uh, predatory bird, uh, and either before it was killed or that, or maybe that's what killed it, and uh, and eaten there. So. Uh, bird must have had a, a nest above a cave because it was found in a cave, but, uh, um, yeah, kind of sad. 1.97 to 1.78 million years ago. That is Australopithecus sediba. It is a very recent member of the Australopiths, uh, discovered by Lee Berger and his son, his, I think, 10 or 11 year old son at the time in 2010. Uh, they just happened to have gone to a, a, an old blasting site. So it was a site where prospectors in this part of South Africa in the turn of the 20th century, um, uh, you know, around 1900s, um, had come in and they were testing for ore. They, they were looking for certain kinds of ore, and they would do that by throwing dynamite into caves and then looking through the rubble. Uh, and they apparently did that, didn't find what they wanted, and then left. Well, Lee's son uh, amuses himself while dad's working by going around and I, just looking for fossils, looking for for um, creatures, all sorts of things that, that kids do, right? Uh, and then he comes back with part of this skull intact. And what must have happened is this fossil, Lee goes down into the cave, figures out where rock came from, and sure enough, there's a bunch of fossils right there. They had blown it up, and part of it had blown out of the cave <laughs> several hundred feet, and his son just happened to pick it up, and that led to this discovery. Really interesting. Why is it important? It has a mosaic of not just Australopith, but also genus Homo characteristics. We don't see this in any of the other Australopiths. Dental features much closer to modern humans. Uh, the face size and shape is more like Homo. You can see much smaller zygomatic arches there than the other Australopiths. Uh, its pelvic features might indicate they are a little more like Homo than, than uh, Australopiths. Is it related to genus Homo? Lee Berger strongly leans in that w direction. A lot of scientists think probably not. Some even think it's not really it, it, that. It's just a it's just a regional variation of Australopithecus, uh, and that we shouldn't get too excited. But again, it raises the question: Do the traits that make genus Homo all come together, like? in one snap, or is it this sort of intermingling of traits from closely related species that eventually solidifies into the first members of the genus Homo? It's a good question. Okay, so I am going to leave it there for now. Uh, the thing about the grass owl uh, australopiths is they are widespread, they adapted to a number of different uh, uh, situations. Their anatomy is generalized for the most part, uh, except for being bipeds. And, uh, um, and they completely changed the way uh, we thought about evolution multiple times, human evolution, uh, not least of which actually knocking Europeans off their high horse and saying, no, actually, life, the human life began in Africa. So thank you very much again. Uh, I hope you take care of yourself this week and uh, have a great time. I'll see you soon.